Girls are raised to be blind to the double standards from which we benefit. It's not wool in front of one's eyes at that point, but duct tape over them. Pulling it off is hard and tends to offend the nerves quite a bit. HBR Talk with Hannah Wallen When I was a kid, my brother and I had a toy car, similar in selling point to the battery-operated bump-and-go car. Upon hitting any stationary object, the car would back up an inch or two, turn slightly, and start forward again. It was kind of fun to run it through a messy room and watch it navigate around all the other toys, or send it into a corner and watch it bump and turn its way back out, or place it where no turn could free it and watch it get stuck slowly ping-ponging itself around in a circle. Where else have I seen something like this? I get it in political discussion all the time. We've talked about the zero-sum game wherein many people are unable to discuss human rights issues from the standpoint that they should apply to everyone, but instead react as if human rights recognition for a given demographic relies on ignoring or infringing on the human rights of the proverbial other. An example is feminists accusing due process advocates of opposing the rights of crime victims, supposedly denying them justice. We know the fallacy in that. Basing government authorities' response to criminal allegations on evidence and reason isn't a way to thwart justice, but to ensure that the pursuit of vengeance in the wake of one injustice does not lead to another injustice and an abuse of community resources. The knee-jerk reaction, however, is not to see it that way. The underlying view of human rights as a tug-of-war between the sexes leads to the unconscious view of women's human rights struggle as evidence of an imbalance between the sexes, with women at the short end of the strand of recognition and men at the long end. This creates the illusion of a need to even things out that necessitates shortening men's end of the strand in order to lengthen women's end. In our example, it makes it easier to mistake compromise of men's due process rights for a pathway to evening things out in sexual violence cases, placing due process advocates in the position of having to dismantle that misconception before even discussing the importance of an evidence-based justice system. We've also talked about a phenomenon Allison labeled the negative-sum game, wherein our society is so willing to treat men as disposable that not only is adversity easier to recognize as a problem when its effects on women are highlighted, but it's actually harder for people to recognize the same adversity as the same level of problem if its effects on men are highlighted. It's presumed not as bad if it hurts both sexes as if it only hurts women. If we discuss human rights from a standpoint that sees the strand of recognition as simply too short altogether, with both sexes disadvantaged and both sexes in need of the benefits of social and legal reform, we are accused of minimizing the problem, not because this hurts everyone is smaller than this hurts women, but because gynocentrists view a factor's relationship to men as a normalizing effect that, in turn, minimizes its overall threat. One of the biggest disconnects men's rights activism butts up against is that we see an entirely different picture, and we do not shy away from it, even when it is hard to face. We see that both sexes face different versions of the conditions to which feminists claim to object, an unfair matrix of legal and social standards and practices, including obligations, expectations, restrictions, and stereotypes that have disadvantaged individuals of both sexes throughout history. There is no tug-of-war, just an effort to dismantle aspects of our society's standards and practices that are detrimental or damaging to individual or community welfare. We don't confuse normal with okay or atypical with wrong. We'd be in trouble from the get-go if we did because atypical is an apt descriptor one way or another for most of us. This is why, when confronted with information that challenges our subconscious attitudes, preconceived notions, upbringing, and self-images, we respond with unrelenting curiosity rather than fear and avoidance. We're that kid who looks in the closet or under the bed to find out what that noise was while the other kids are all screaming for an adult to come save them from the monster, because we're more intrigued than afraid. And it turns out, there is no monster, only information. It's when we share that information that the bump-and-go phenomenon takes place. This week I saw it in four separate conversations. 
One tweep was doing okay with the idea that there are areas in which men are disadvantaged, as long as she could cling to the image of women having it worse throughout history, maintain the privilege of having her sensibilities toward harsh language coddled, and expect other women to back her if she insisted on enforcing those conditions on the conversation. Another just could not see his way to including equal accountability in a discussion on reproductive rights. A third took issue with the idea that men face any discrimination at all. A whole host of women jumped at the chance to take personally a tweet sent out by Bettina Arndt in response to an article on the potential for a new Twitter emoji to be used as commentary on men's penis size, in which she merely wondered how feminists would react if the sexes were reversed in it. Their response was a priceless display of lack of self-awareness and entitlement to a double standard they couldn't even fully recognize, proving her point better than she could have done had she made a declaration instead of asking a question. One woman in that conversation was so freaked out by the challenge to the double standard that she went on a goalpost-moving sprint from denying that the article was about its own subject to making up a badly flawed victim story to use as a bludgeon in the discussion. Then she freaked out when called on it and announced that she was muting. In each instance, I saw the same thing, something I've seen in the past as well, over and over. Individuals whose preconceived notions regarding gender issues were formed based on incomplete or incorrect information recoiled from the presentation of facts and logic that contradicted those beliefs, then turned and attempted to steer the conversation in a different direction. It was like the information was affected by the somebody else's problem field described in Life, the Universe, and Everything by Douglas Adams, such that anyone confronted with it would go to subtle but extraordinary measures to disregard rather than deal with it. Only in this case, it's not just a subtle avoidance reaction. It's underwritten by fear. Information that contradicts a single political position is not, in and of itself, scary. But when it contradicts a part of the foundation upon which one's entire outlook is based, it's terrifying. People will do anything to avoid it. A lot of the phenomenon of special pleading in arguments comes from the debater's inability to wrap his or her mind around a concept that challenges one of those foundational attitudes or beliefs. An individual accustomed to a hierarchy of accountability that places women between men and children instead of on the same level as men simply cannot come to grips with a debate point that relies on gender-equal accountability standards. Evidence of men's vulnerability will unnerve an individual who only sees them as powerful or strong, or even just treats reliability as a defining male characteristic. These confrontations are the solid object the mind cannot bypass, the door to the closet where the boogeyman hides, ready to jump out and tell you that women are not wonderful, but only human that men are not gods or devils, but also only human. The resulting mental gymnastics are the discussion version of the holy freaking yucky spider heebie-jeebie dance, not just at the ideas, but at this suddenly creepy individual who dares to discuss them. By virtue of having your hand on the door, of having pulled the blankets up to stare into the abyss, you're now infected with whatever it is that your discussion partner cannot bring him or herself to confront. You have triggered the normie. Prepare for meltdown.